Hey everyone, uh, good morning, and thank you very much for taking time out and listening to me speak here. Uh, so I'm I'm based out of Melbourne, Australia. So this is early morning for me. So if I'm a little grumpy, I have still not had my first cup of coffee. So please uh, bear with me. Uh, it's sad that I was not able to come down there, but I'm really really happy and glad that uh, I'm able to share with you a topic which I love. Uh, I'm passionate about which is responding to advanced adversaries. How do we get back to threat actors? Uh, the way I look at things is we put up, uh, we put adversaries in kind of three buckets. Uh, we start with the topmost or the most advanced, the most persistent one, which is often called APT, advanced persistent threat. But uh, what we're talking about is uh, nation state threat actors, state nexus or state sponsored threat actors. Uh, that's the top bucket. And then we look at e-crime threat actors, uh, primarily ransomware these days, threat actors that come in, uh, they are there for money. Uh, their only purpose is to make as much money as they can, as quickly as they can. Uh, those are the e-crime threat actors. And then the third bucket we are talking about are hacktivists. Not that common anymore, uh, but still they are, uh, they are painful to deal with because you never know what they are there for. Uh, what I'm going to focus on in this talk is the top tier adversary, which is a, uh, which is also called an advanced attacker, a nation state, a APT, you know, whatever you want to call them. That's what we are dealing with uh, in this talk today. Uh, I did a very similar talk last time in Sands uh, Blue Team Summit, which was about e-crime and ransomware. Uh, this time, uh, based on some questions and feedback I got from that one, I thought it would be interesting to talk about advanced adversaries. So before we jump in and start talking about advanced adversaries and how do we respond to them, uh, let's take a quick second and I'll talk about where do I come from. Primarily because I do want you to understand that I have my biases. I come from a place where I have done this for a while. I may have my biases. I may look at certain things certain ways. So just to be clear that we are on the same page, let me talk about a bit about myself. Uh, I work with a company called CrowdStrike. I hope most of you have heard about it. I'm based out of Melbourne, uh, Australia, uh, leading a team of incident response consultants doing IR, day in, day out. That's what I've done for around eight, nine years now. Before that, I've done red teaming and uh, helping organizations set up their security operation centers. Uh, that's my background. Uh, I work with a lot of organizations while they are in the middle of breaches, both nation state as well as e-crime. Uh, you would have guessed by now that I like the nation state stuff more, but most of us do. Uh, that's what I've been doing for a while now. Uh, I'm a GSE, so picked up certification around eight years back. Uh, uh, and uh, I also teach for the Sands Institute. I've spoken at some of the conferences before. So putting that aside, let's talk about what we are going to talk about today. We are going to talk about the top tier adversary, the bucket, which is often known as nation state protectors. Uh, state nexus, what they are there for is a targeted attack. We're going to start with talking about the phases of a state nexus targeted attack. Now I'm going to take a, a wider picture and say, okay, these are the three phases, how these attackers work. And then we're going to go deep dive and talk about a few TTPs of these advanced adversaries. Now, a lot of these adversaries use a lot of different techniques. So you know, we don't have time to go through everything. Uh, but what I've done is I've picked some of the techniques, more commonly used techniques, just to give us a frame of reference of what we are dealing with. So we're going to talk about their TTPs. And then in the end, we'll talk about what do we do if we identify uh, advanced adversary in our environment. Uh, what I do want you to take away from this discussion uh, is understand a targeted attack, a state nexus targeted attack, uh, and then get a frame of mind of how do you respond to such an attack. So for, for us to understand how do we respond to such attacks, it is important for us to understand who are the adversaries we are dealing with. Why are they there? What are they there for? Typically, a state nexus intrusion or a, an actor would be working for their nation state in interest of their nation state. Uh, they are well-funded. And when I'm saying well-funded, they are really, really well-funded. Uh, 
often well funded or more funded than what a typical enterprise, even a Fortune 500 company will have. They are there with all the resources they need and they are attacker with a purpose. And that makes a difference. They are there because they are very, very focused on actions on objectives. So they have clear actions on objectives in their mind. They have intel requirements, which often come from their handlers, which work for states, nation states. And their entire purpose is to make sure that those intelligence requirements are met. That having said that, it doesn't mean that they are only there for cyber espionage. That's probably the large chunk of it. But nation states also perform destructive and disruptive attacks and currency generation. I'm going to talk about some of these as we go ahead. Now, as I said, to understand how we're going to deal with this, let's understand what are typically the three phases of such an attack. Now, I've put them in a context where I'm not going into specifics of how they do it, but primarily putting them in three objectives. As a lot of intrusions start, nation state attacks also start by uh, the first part, which is gaining access. So that's where they gain access into the environment. Now, the difference here being uh, from an e-crime threat actor is that this may have happened months or years ago than when you actually detected them, because that's what they are there for. They want to remain covert. They want to not get detected. Once they have gained access, they move into a phase where they now want to deploy persistence and maintain that access in the environment. Maintaining that access in the environment is very, very important for such threat actors because they don't want to lose that foothold in the environment and access to the environment once they have gained that. I worked on several cases where we couldn't see the threat actor doing any actions on objectives, as in not exfiltrating data, not destroying the systems, but they had just put persistence mechanisms, covert persistence mechanisms, which were very, very difficult to detect, but they were there. The idea being when they need that access, they do have that access. So that's where maintaining access comes into picture. Now, once they have deployed those persistence mechanisms throughout the environment, they move on to maintaining that access. So continually making sure that that access is not removed and performing action on objectives, which is cyber espionage often. So they can steal the data as and when they need it or as and when that Intel requirements come to them from their handlers. Now, these phases of maintaining access and performing action on objectives often span months and years. Several cases which I've worked on, I've seen uh, the dwell time, which is time from when the threat actor gained access to the time when they were detected being years. So recently, I was working on a case uh, which was attributed to a Chinese, nation, a Chinese nexus adversary the dwell time went back to eight years. So these threat actors are there to stay for long term. Now, having said that, let's move on and talk about each of these phases a bit. As I said, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the TTPs of these threat actors. Uh, usually, the, the way I do this is start from gaining access, but I'm going to do it in the reverse way because for these nation states, for us to understand how they work, it is important to understand what they are there for. Once we have understood what they are there for, it makes our job easier, relatively easier, to try and get them out of our environment. So let's first talk about what is action on objectives for these kind of adversaries. There are three buckets where we're going to put them in. The first one, which is primarily the, the primary aim of a lot of these threat actors, is cyber espionage. So working on uh, threat actors like Light Basin with their target telecom companies, Nobelium, uh, also known as APT28, Cozy Bear, they're primarily focused on making sure that they can meet the Intel requirements of their adversaries and they are able to provide them the data which they are being requested for. So they are there to exfiltrate data, look for data, exfiltrate data as and when the data gets available. So they're not here for one-time data exfiltration. They're gonna stay there. They're gonna wait for data to get generated often and keep taking that out 
or take that out whenever there is a requirement. So that is primarily the action on objectives number one bucket, the largest bucket we see, which is cyber espionage. Also, often threat actors, uh, often defenders think of nation state threat actors as just performing cyber espionage. But these threat actors also perform disruptive and destructive attacks. Uh, if you go back and start looking at what these threat actors have done in the past, we can talk about Sony Pictures attack, WannaCry, the Ukraine power grid, a lot of these DOS attacks which have originated from nation states, uh, often for a purpose or because uh, someone did something which they didn't like or they just want to prove a point. So threat actors have done this before, they continue to do this with the primary aim of making a political statement often or just to being destructive and disruptive. So North Korean threat actors have done it a lot. Russian threat, uh, Russia-based threat actors have done that in the past. So that is disruptive attacks. The third bucket, which is interesting, which is very, very interesting is crypto heist. So making money. If you go back 2016, there was a major attack that happened or major breach which is known as the Bangladesh Bank Cyber East, where a lot of money was moved out of that bank uh, through the transfers going into Sri Lanka and Philippines, and that money went out. Now that used to be the modus operandi of making money by these nation state threat actors, primarily North Korean state-based uh, adversaries. That has changed of late. That has changed because where the money is has changed. Uh, these threat actors are now targeting cryptocurrency exchanges, where there's a lot of money lying around. Uh, they, these, a lot of these corrupt crypto companies, they do not have the kind of security posture they should have. Uh, the kind of money they are moving, they are moving large sums of money. And you pick them up and look at a bank and the kind of uh, IT security a bank has invested in and some of these crypto companies have, uh, they don't match up. So these threat actors have started targeting or they have been targeting for a while these crypto exchanges and other crypto based companies. Uh, what you see on the screen is an alert from CISA talking about trade traitor, uh, a, a North Korean adversary targeting blockchain companies. Uh, there have been a lot of these attacks recently where a lot of money has been moved out. Uh, then it becomes a, a rat and uh, a mouse and a cat game to figure out if that uh, money transfer can be blocked. So these threat actors have moved on from banks. They, have, they are focusing on these crypto exchanges to generate a lot of money to support the regimes. So that, those are the three primary reasons why threat actors, uh, which are nation state backed, state nexus targeting these organizations. Now, having said that, let's now talk about the maintain access phase, which is very, very critical for these, as, these adversaries, as I said earlier, uh, because they do not want to lose this access once they have gained that access by putting in a lot of effort often. They typically go for covert persistence, making sure that they do not get detected. There are a lot of ways of getting this persistence in. They, they can have Active Directory-based persistence. They can have things like golden SAML attack and golden ticket attacks, uh, very novel techniques of how they make sure that the threat actor or they can continue to, gain, continue to have access in an environment. This access often is very, very deeply embedded, as in they will put these backdoors on several machines, or they will put several different types of persistence. So if you are looking for them and you are able to find out accounts which they have added, so you were able to see that, okay, the threat actor came in, they added one domain admin account, and they are probably using that as a mechanism to access the environment, and the defenders delete that, they would often have more than that method as persistence. So they may put web shells, they may have other accounts which they have gained access to. A lot of times they have put backdoors in. And these backdoors and implants are put into machines that are strategic, which may not be rebuilt or which may not be looked at often. So that's a method which these threat actors do. Uh, another common way how these threat actors are coming in these days is using valid credentials and connected over VPN. Now that is a standard practice with e-crime threat actors, as well as these nation state adversaries. And that's very, very interesting because once they can do that, once they can gain access to a valid credential and come over a VPN, they are essentially invisible. They are just like any other employee. 
They can use out of band management softwares, AnyDesk, TeamViewer, ConnectWise. A lot of organizations have these in their environment. They may not have approved this for IT use, but there is a lot of shadow IT. And threat actors love that because you now don't know that this any desk which you have running in your environment, is that legit, approved? Or is that something which the threat actor installed because the threat actor wanted access to your environment? And then there are a lot of these stealthier approaches. The, the recent one which came out uh, was a blog from Mandiant on ESXi-based persistence. Now that is stealthy. Oftentimes it is very difficult to get visibility into what is happening on an ESXi machine. One more thing which threat detectors have known to do is maintain high level of operational security. Now, what, what does that mean from a perspective of us defenders looking for, for these threat detectors? Often when we are doing investigations, we are going by static indicators like IP addresses, uh, names of the system. So if a threat actor is coming over a VPN, we figure out what IP address the threat actor comes from, what account the threat actor uses, uh, what is the name of the system they are coming from. This kind of information can then be used to scope out the investigation to figure out, okay, the threat actor logged in 8 a.m. today and they logged in a week before also. A lot of these adversaries which are in this bucket of nation state and advanced uh, they keep changing that. So they will start using system names that blend in with what an organization uses, which means it's now difficult to figure out, is this adversary or is this a legit system? They may even use the same names. So now you have to uh, have a machine. I pick up that name and we look at it and say, yep, that's our system. Uh, they may not even reuse the IP addresses which they're coming from, making it difficult. Uh, they may also blend in normal admin activities. So I see that admin account coming in and the admin account is now doing normal business activity. And then suddenly they do one or two things which are malicious activities. So it becomes difficult as they are blending in and making sure that they look like any normal administrator logging in into your environment. One specific piece of persistence or one specific type of persistence I do want to pick on and that one is web shells. Now, this is probably one of my favorite uh, from, a, from a perspective of how this works. Web shells are really, really difficult to detect. They are very simple, but they are very, very effective as a persistence mechanism. Not only as a persistence mechanism, they are also used as initial vectors. Uh, of late, we have seen a lot of vulnerabilities come out. So what the detectors have done is they have used vulnerabilities like proxy shell, deployed web shells and used that as an initial vector into the environment. That means that the threat actor can come in, they can put that web shell, go away, and then come back later at any time to make sure that they have that access. They, as I said, they are very, very difficult to detect. It could be just one line of code in your entire web website code, which is acting as a web shell. And often to understand that's a web shell or it has the capabilities to run commands on the underlying OS. What is needed is to understand the context of how that web shell is running. So it becomes difficult to detect these web shells uh, and hence they are a preferred method of a lot of adversaries to keep a second persistence mechanism as a backup plan. So you, know, you were on to them, you change the passwords of the accounts they were using to come over the VPN. Uh, maybe you deployed MFA uh, and they lost access. So what do they do? They use these web shells, which are their backup plans to ensure that the access to the environment is maintained. Another thing which these threat actors are often doing these days is use of reverse proxy tooling. So tools like ngrok, SSH clients like plink, and there are other tools which can be used to expose, expose services out in the environment. So what the threat actor does in this case is they run this ngrok and plink and such tools on a machine. So what we are seeing is the threat actor has already gained access to the environment. They have admin access. So they will start running these tools on a machine internal to the environment. And they can then expose ports from this machine out on the internet. So what defenders like us would see is a connection going out that could be on port 443. But what this connection is 
doing is it's exposing a port on this machine. So you could be running RDP on this machine and this ngrok process is now exposing that on the internet, which the threat actor can then access, which essentially means they are running ngrok and plink, SSH clients, uh, which are often signed, legit, often used by organizations for legit business purposes. They're not using an implant there, which could be easier to detect or identify. So which means that they just fly under the radar, making it difficult for defenders to detect them and then take action on what they are doing. Now, all this doesn't work if they don't have credentials. Now, I do want to talk a bit about credentials. I know this is something which a lot of people talk about and uh, you may have heard about it. Uh, but credential dumping remains one of the most important ways of how threat actors make sure that they gain that access and keep that access. That credential dumping can happen on workstations, endpoints, servers, where they are using tools like Mimikatz. Now Mimikatz has become relatively easier to detect by a lot of antivirus, a lot of AV products. Uh, they click, they pick that up and they trigger that and alert on that and stop that. But that's not the only way how threat actors dump credentials. A common way of what threat actors are doing these days is use living up the land techniques or lolbas or tools that are already available on machines. Use those to dump the LSAS memory, the local security authority subsystem memory, that's where all the credentials reside. So here uh, they can use things like task manager. Yep, the, the normal task manager running on a Windows machine. They just open it up, go to the LSAS process, right click and say, dump this and take it offline. Uh, there are products from sysinternal like uh, procdump, procmon. Uh, these can be used to do dumping of memory space. So LSAS can be dumped using these. And there are some other tools which come by default uh, in Windows, like this .NET uh, create dump, which can help protector to dump that LSS memory, which they are out of. Once they have dumped this, they can take it offline, use Mimikatz or any other tool to crack these hashes, which are in, the, in these memory files. Now, if I talk about workstations and how passwords are dumped on workstation, I'll not be doing justice if I don't talk about NTDS.dev. NTDS.dev resides in domain controllers. That's where all the keys to the kingdom reside. That's the entire database of usernames and password hashes. Uh, threat actors most of the times do this. They will dump NTDS.dev, take it offline, and make sure that they have access to all the hashes, which then they can use to access the environment. Now, while I'm talking about NTDS.dev and seeing all the hashes, Think of what we are talking about. We are talking about machine account hashes, service accounts, curb TGT accounts, other different service accounts which are used by services, admin accounts, privileged accounts, user accounts, all these accounts. They are very, very difficult to change, often not changed at all in organizations, some of these accounts. So threat actors dump these, take it offline, and then they have access to this in these hashes which they can then use. Uh, there are a few other ways how they dump this NTDS.dev. Uh, they can also use tools, uh, techniques like DC sync just to pick up some hashes which they require. But in one form or the other, they look for these hashes and credentials, which then they can keep with them and use at a later time also. So that is deploying persistence and maintaining access. Let's also talk about how do they gain access to an environment. Now that is very, very important because nation states have patience. And when we talk about how threat actors work and these intrusions, patience is a virtue. They can perform that OSINT, open source intelligence gathering, reconnaissance for days and months. They're not looking to make quick buck. They are looking to spend time to gain access to an environment. Often what I say is, how advanced an adversary is in APT, so advanced persistent threat, how advanced they are, uh, is decided by how much time they are willing to spend performing reconnaissance and open source intelligence gathering. So these nation state adversaries, they do have time for that. Uh, they do have access to a lot of different environments, so they can gather information from there and use it to attack someone else. 
they are willing to talk to their victims. So targeting over social networks has awfully happened, uh, especially for these some of these crypto exchange attacks. Uh, they are there to identify vulnerabilities, throw zero days in if they needed, uh, use zero days wherever they need to. So another way to put APT is uh, not an advanced persistent threat, but an adequate persistent threat. So they just want to throw zero days wherever they have to, wherever the target is worth it. Uh, and then they can keep, they can gain access to that environment. Now, talking about initial vector, these are some of the initial vectors which these threat actors use. Now, again, as I said, I'm just picking up some of the proof of concepts, if I say, or some of some of the ways, not all of the ways. Uh, valid credentials, password spraying, that still remains one of the top choice of these adversaries to gain access. Now, if you're thinking MFA solves this, hold on to that thought because, uh, because I'm going to talk about that uh, in a couple of slides from now. They compromise vulnerable internet-facing systems. Now, that has picked up pace of last couple of years. There are a lot of vulnerabilities that have come out. So these threat actors compromise that, gain access, and then they can come back. And I'm going to talk about this one also in just a minute. Spear phishing campaigns remain uh, another choice of these threat actors. Another thing that has picked up pace is the supply chain attacks. Not only supply chain attacks, partner organizations and global offices. So one thing that we are seeing often threat actors do is they gain access to a global office or a partner organization where the security posture is a little lower and once they have gained that access, they can then move from that organization or the partner or the global office to the HQ or the headquarter if that's where they want to go. Uh, that's an interesting technique, has been happening for a while, but has definitely picked up pace in the last couple of years. And then the supply chain attacks, oh, they don't, they just don't seem to be going away. Uh, CrowdStrike just published a blog. So I was looking around and seeing what examples should I talk about? What better than talk about something fresh out of the oven? So here, what you see is September 30th. That's when CrowdStrike published this blog about a supply chain attack via COM 100 chat installer. Uh, actor gained access to that company likely, and then they published a Trojan installer, which when was downloaded and installed, means the actor had access to the environment. And who can forget that solar winds breach that happened a couple of years back? Another example, right out of the oven from Microsoft. So Microsoft published an advisory. This one is from CISA on September 30th, a couple of days back, about new Microsoft Exchange Server zero-day vulnerabilities. Now, they don't seem to end. A favorite among threat actors to gain access to an environment and then deploy persistence. So this one is what they have been doing for a while. So gain access to an environment and don't do action on objectives right away. Just deploy persistence and go away. A lot of detectors did that when proxy shell came out. They did that when a lot of these VPN device vulnerabilities came out. Uh, they exploited those vulnerabilities, picked up information they needed to come back later, or just deployed a, a web shell and went away. What that means is, the vulnerability came out, the threat actor looked around, deployed a web shell, went away. Uh, defenders and blue teamers looked at the advisories that came out from everyone. You know, Microsoft released advisories, CISA released advisories. There was a lot of news around, please patch your Microsoft Exchange servers. They came to that and deployed patches and the blue team thought, yep, patched, done, we are safe. But what they didn't look at is, was this vulnerability exploited by a threat actor? Did they deploy another persistence mechanism which they can then use to come back? So that has happened a lot. I've put, in, put on some of the examples on the slides. Uh, that includes Microsoft Exchange vulnerabilities, the Fortinet vulnerabilities, the Zoho Manage Engine. A lot of these threat actors have done that in the past and uh, my team is still investigating those. So what a year and a half or so for Proxy Shell, uh, we are still seeing. And the Fortinet vulnerabilities were years ago because threat actors have gained that access organization patched them, but they didn't remove something which the threat actors would have put in. Now, if you were thinking, I have MFA, that solves everything. Now, I'm a big proponent of MFA. I strongly believe MFA is the cost of doing business on the internet, and you do need to have MFA. But there are ways how threat actors make sure that they can go around the MFA, uh, MFA hurdle, which has been created. 
like MFA fatigue attacks, which have been talked for a while. Uh, they have been there for a long time now where the threat actor keeps trying to log in using a valid credential and the user keeps getting that MFA. And uh, if that happens, the user looks at it and say, oh, how many of these prompts do I need to get? And probably the only way to send them away is to accept them. That's what they do. Uh, that means MFA is bypassed. These kind of threat actors, once they have access to the environment, they often look for those accounts which do not have MFA installed. If you're thinking that's not you, trust me, I have worked with a lot of organizations and there are always those accounts. Often CXOs, uh, sometimes people like you and me who work in security, system administrators, they don't want to put MFA, so they will put their account as a special account which doesn't need MFA to come in. Threat actors come in, they look for those accounts, they steal those credentials so that they are also not, not asked MFA and they can continue to come in. Uh, another thing they use is self-enrollment processes. So if uh, I worked on a few cases where self-enrollment of MFA was allowed, so the threat actor comes in, they enroll themselves very nicely for a new, device, new MFA token and then they can use it. Or if there are accounts which still do not have MFA set up for them. So you're setting up MFA. These are dormant accounts. They try to log in the first time they're asked, do you want to set up an MFA? And the threat actor is like, jackpot, I do want to. And I'm going to use that to come and access this environment. Now, having talked about a lot of these techniques and giving a sense of what these threat actors are doing, uh, let me put forward a question to you. Let's play a game. A game which can look like whack-a-mole or a game of chess. Now, exactly this is how whack-a-mole looks like. That's what you see. That's what a lot of organizations do when they have to remove or respond to these adversaries. There's an alert. They isolate that machine. They see an account being used. They disable the password. They see a piece of malware. They delete it. Or they sometimes even run an AV and say, oh, no alert, we are safe. That's exactly how that approach works. And that's whack-a-mole. You can keep playing that for months and years. The threat actor likely would not go away. The other way to deal with this problem is being a little more strategic and play it like a game of chess. Now, this is probably one of the most difficult conversations to have with executives when you tell them that, Yes, we know there is a threat actor in your environment, but we're not going to remove that excess because we're going to wait and make a plan to kick them out. No one wants that. A lot of it was a lot of executives don't want to hear that because if there is something, you just kill it or stamp it or remove it. But that's how whack a mole is played. I just don't want to go to the next slide. I love looking at that whack a mole game. Uh, but let's move on. So how does that game of chess look like? And that's my advice. If you have an adversary, that's what we play with the adversary, not a game of whack-a-mole because I don't like losing in front of adversaries. So once you start looking at game of chess, that's how you remove a threat actor from your environment. Gain host-based visibility. You understand what the threat actor is doing, how deep the rabbit hole goes, understand the intrusion, and then perform a removal event. Now this look, sounds very simple. It is. It takes a little more effort than what I'm saying it does, or rather um, a lot more effort, a lot more resources, but this strategy works. But then the question comes up, how long do I wait to gather this information? When do I perform eradication? So if you detect an incident here, I'm looking at this time of performing analysis understanding the threat actor, understanding their TTPs. And that understanding of the TTP goes up here as attack knowledge. So there will be a time that will come where the 80-20 rule starts applying, where you can spend more time performing analysis, but you're not essentially gaining more information about the threat actor. And that is somewhere here. And that's when I recommend you perform the coordinated removal or remediation event. At this time, we will have an understanding of the threat actor TTPs, as well as likely performed some improvements in our security posture. 
that's where we perform the eradication event. We remove all the malware which the threat actor has put in, remove their excess, and they are gone. One thing which often comes up is how do we change those passwords? Remember, I talked about protectors stealing LSAS and NTDS.dit. Changing those passwords is not easy. We're looking at enterprise-wide password reset. We're looking at performing curb DGT account reset. Uh, service accounts, ah, oh man, those are painful to change. Service accounts are probably the single most difficult set of accounts to change passwords for. So my recommendation right away is do that before an intrusion hits you. So use MSA, GMSA, uh, managed service accounts, group managed service accounts, or at least have an inventory of how you're going to change those when the time happens. Because what happens is four years back, 10 years back, someone set that up and still works. So how, why do I need to change? And that person who set that up left the job, they moved on. And now things work. And if I touch it, it's going to break. So these are very, very difficult to change. Then there are DSRM accounts and domain trust keys, certificates for IDPs. Uh, ensure the MFA coverage. Check if one person has one MFA and that is the person who's using that MFA. Then we are looking at changing passwords for network devices, re rotating computer account passwords, re resetting local admin password. Uh, if you don't use LAPS, have a look at that. Uh, it is not a pleasure to change local account passwords if you do not have something like the local administrator password solution, and then application passwords. So think about how time consuming something like this is. Prepping for this takes a lot of time and then executing this does take a lot of time. And once the eradication event has completed, probably we'll have a clean environment. So the other question which comes up is, what do I do in this entire process? So I, I've tried to condense it and that's what you do, slow down when you detect an uh, advanced adversary, slow down, because fast is not fast, smooth is fast. That's how these actors work, and that's how we as defenders need to work. This is not a ransomware incident where we just need to go ahead and start breaking things and kicking threat actors out. Stay calm. I know easier said than done. Create a plan. Now, that plan may mean you need external support. You may need more resources. Uh, you may need a team which is going to analyze, identify, by a team which will create the eradication event plan. Visibility comes into picture a lot. You will need host-based visibility. So if there is no EDR or any other ways to figure out what's happening in your environment, it is going to be very difficult to kill the threat actor excess. And once you have a plan, execute it, and you will exit the metrics. Takeaways from this discussion which we have had. As I said, slow down and stay calm. The threat actor has probably already done action on objectives. They've already stolen the data. Now, you may have detected them now in your environment, but they probably had access for months, if not years. So they've probably stolen what they need. Now what is important is how do we scope this out and kick the threat actor out of the environment? And that will lead us to stay calm, create a plan, and execute it. Another thing interesting is when you are performing the CRE events or eradication events, it is it's important to prepare for long haul because if they were in your environment, they are interested in what you have. And if they are, they're going to probably come back. They will try to regain that access if they lost it because they have numbers to meet. They have performance goals. Uh, they're going to try to gain that access back in the environment. Uh, they may even try using the implants or stealthier approaches which they had deployed uh, because let's face it, uh, we may miss something because the threat actors have deployed it at so many places. So make sure that monitoring and visibility is there so that if that happens, uh, you are on to them this time quicker than what you were next the last time. Uh, that's all what I had to share. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, I just wanted to share some of the thoughts I had on how uh, these threat actors can be dealt with. Uh, that's my Twitter. That's my LinkedIn. Please reach out to me if you have any comments, any questions, you want to have a chat. Uh, please uh, reach out to me and add me in the social channels and I'll be happy to connect.